So if you think about the role of a customer success manager, I've been calling it a unicorn. They are a unicorn. They have got several hats that they wear and mm -hmm. bless their heart for the job that they do. Hey there, Powder Keg fans. This is episode 96 of Powder Keg Igniting Startups, the show for entrepreneurs, investors, leaders, and innovators building remarkable tech companies in areas outside of Silicon Valley. I'm your host, Matt Hunkler, and today we'll be talking about customer experience, the future of the industry, and how it's continuing to evolve, but also just what that whole startup life cycle is like with two amazing startup founders. Uh, you know, customer experience is your customer's perception of how your company treats them. And these perceptions affect their behaviors and build memories and feelings that ultimately drive their loyalty. In other words, if they like you and continue to like you, they're going to do business with you and recommend you to others for a long, long time. So we're going to cover a lot of ground today, and I want to just dive right in and introduce two great friends and guests on the podcast today. Our first guest started out his career as a software developer and systems engineer, then segued into business development of many uh, of a few international organizations. He's grown his current team from 2015 to where it is today, raising 1.5 million last year. Please help me welcome all the way from Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, the CEO and co-founder of a customer success work management platform, Bolstra, Haresh Gagwani. Harash, thanks for being back on the podcast, man. Thank you, thank you. Much appreciated, and it's a pleasure. Absolutely, and we'll make sure we uh, link up your past episode uh, in yeah, the show notes as great. well. Uh, and then we also have another veteran of the show back uh, back again today to talk about a company he was not working on, at least to my knowledge, last time he was on the show. Um, our second guest started out his career within the Orr Fellowship Program, which is a program I was involved in right here in Indiana, connecting uh, people with their first time full-time career or full-time job outside of the university with a high growth technology or venture associated business. He quickly got the knack for entrepreneurship, starting several companies, including the one he manages now. Please help me welcome the co-founder and CEO of Shipment Tracking Platform for e-commerce businesses, a startup called Malomo. Help me welcome Yao Ene. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for Sorry. being here, man. Yeah. It's so funny that my, my intros are like, very much associated for like a crowd, but it's, it's literally just us three sitting in here. I'm like, please help me welcome. And hopefully you're at home listening to this and just clapping with your, your headphones in. Um, I wanted to kick this off, guys, um, just talking a little bit about your background, because I know you both have very interesting ways that you got into the startups that you're running today. And yeah, I know you just started this business or at least announced it yeah, 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 very yeah, recently, yeah. raised a little bit of money here yeah. uh, from some well-known folks, uh, which is really exciting. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested to hear kind of your backstory of how it how it all got started. So, yeah, do you remember your first entrepreneurial memory? Oh yeah, I uh, so I used to in school. I would uh, well, sorry, growing up, I would uh, you know I was trying to get into everything. I would I would go to my parents and try to sell them the book that they'd buy me for <laughs> <laughs> to read. Um, and so yeah, it, it always felt like uh, launching new businesses was in the blood of our of our family. Um, and, uh, and, and my parents always encouraged me to go out and try to find something that I loved and was passionate about. Um, and, and entrepreneurship was one of those big things. So, uh, so yeah, it, it, I mean, I, when, I, when I was graduating college, like you said, Matt, we joined the Orr Fellowship, and that was like the really, uh, the really great experience to figure out, you know, how do you launch a company from scratch? Um, I, I uh, studied engineering in school, and so I had a lot of technical experience, but you know, those, the mechanics of how do you find a market, how do you analyze that market, how do you figure out what to build and, and produce a product that they're gonna use and love and pay for, was something I was very foreign to me. So the Orr Fellowship was that jumping point to get a lot of that background and knowledge. Well, and you mentioned sort of like almost engineering uh, what the market is, but I know at some point you got to get feedback from customers or potential customers, yeah. which is a big, big piece of deciding whether or not to launch a business. And probably one of the biggest mistakes, I'm not saying you made this mistake, mm. but one of the biggest mistakes I've seen entrepreneurs make, and I personally have made in the past, is launching a business just based on, well, people are searching for this. Mm. Yeah. That means this, there might, there must be a market for this yeah. and just launching it without talking to anyone yeah, about it. Yeah. Have you, um, in sort of your work in the Or Fellowship and even mentoring some other people in the tech community, um, what are some of the other uh, sort of 
common mistakes that you've seen people make or that maybe even you yourself and yeah. your, your earlier ventures yeah, made? Yeah, so I ran, I ran a digital agency called Sticks and Leaves for a number of years. And I think one of the, the biggest mistakes that people made a lot was they had this they had this vision for their product that was like five years out from what it what what they needed to do today. Yeah. And so they always felt like whenever they'd go and talk to customers, they didn't have enough. So they'd they'd be like, Well, I can't I can't launch this because I don't have this and this and this and this and this. And and they got into this phase where they built so much, uh, they took it to the customer and the customer said, This the only this part is important to me. And the <laughs> other customer would be like, Well, that's not important to me, and none of these other things are important to me. Um, and so I think I think people get get stuck on the love for they have of the vision that they think they want for their product, and don't take a step back and say, you know, how how am I going to take step one uh, to figuring out what's the thing that's going to resonate with um, with a broad group of people. So that, that what was does the that, what does that look like to you? T- tell me how yeah. you, tell me about how you did that with Malomo. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So maybe you can even zoom out a little bit and be like, what what problem did you first see? Yeah. With so uh, so we with with Six and Leaves. So we we launched Malomo out of Six and Leaves. So we spun it out as a new business. It's um, always a great great thing to be <laughs> able to do. Yeah. No, it was, it was awesome. And and uh, we we worked with a lot of consumer centric. Uh, technology companies like Double Map, who I mean, they sell to mm-hmm. businesses what their end users are, are uh, our consumers. Cluster Truck, same thing. Um, we served a lot of e-commerce businesses, and uh, one of the things that we noticed um, in the e-commerce space was uh, you, you would ship something to a customer, and that product may or may not arrive on time. And if it doesn't, it uh, that customer ultimately blames you for that experience being poor when it might have been UPS or FedEx. Um, so the brand for us had no control over that. Hmm. So we thought that that was a unique problem to have like such like customers having a bad experience don't come back to you. And in e-commerce, retention is incredibly important. Yeah. They spend all any, of their any money. Business, yeah, really. Any business, really. Any business for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, but you were seeing it in e-commerce. Yeah, a lot in e-commerce. Yeah. yeah. Um, customer experience in, t- in, in today's world, it's, it's everything with these brands. And so um, we thought that was a really compelling idea. We'd had a lot of experience building tracking platforms in the past and, and, and thought that was good. But uh, we also knew that we had to go validate the idea. Yeah. And it was really difficult because we, as a, as a company, we, we specialize in launching new tech products. I mean, we built 100 dip- web and mobile products over the course of the business. So our first inkling was, well, let's just go build a mini prototype and then show it to people. And we, we had to kind of take a step back and be like, well, what, what would we advise our clients to do if they were in our same situation? What we ended up doing was going out and kind of pitching this problem to uh, brands that we were close with or connected with uh, and, and got some feedback that, yeah, this is a major problem. All of our customer support tickets come from a lot of these where's my order questions. Mm. So what we ended up doing was instead of building anything, we, we told them that we had this technology product that we were going to use. Uh, one of the things that we need in order to implement it is we need to log into your e-commerce systems. Mm. We'd log in, we'd manually grab all of their orders, uh, grab all of the customers. Uh, whenever a new order was placed, we'd then log into an email marketing platform uh, and then send emails directly to the customers whenever their order uh, status changed. Mm-hmm. And so we did that for... I think a thousand packages before we ever wrote a line of code. You did it all manually. Did it all manually. What, what yeah. the software would eventually do. Exactly. Yeah. Or the unique part of the software. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Um, so you weren't like pulling up Gmail and writing a <laughs> crafted <laughs> email. We were not. We were not. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it was close. Like, yeah. It was, it was, it was pretty close. It sounds pretty close. Sounds pretty yeah. close. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yes, yeah, so we did that. And that's what gave us this unique insight that ended up being like the bread and butter of our business, which is customers check tracking three to five times on average. And most brands are uh, sending plain text emails that are not well-timed. And so if they could harness that attention and create a good experience for those customers, they'd be able to retain those customers over the long term. And so that was kind of the genesis of the business. Oh, that's great. Launched it. Yeah. Well, and I want to I want to hear a little bit more what you learned uh, <laughs> yeah. since then. But first, yeah. Haresh, I was hoping uh, maybe yeah. you might share with us what your very first entrepreneurial memory was, or maybe one of the first. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I was, that great commentary, y'all. So <laughs> I was listening to it and I said, let me, let me go back to when I actually stepped into customer experience. And uh, it was back in the early 2000s when I was working for a marketing technology company based out of Indianapolis, one of the few uh, beautiful, beautiful exits that they have had amongst other companies that have had out of Indiana. Sure, a primo was a huge success. Yeah, a primo was, I'm grateful to be part of a primo. So what happened there is 
we signed on a lot of big customers and uh, once the sale happened, that contract went into a team of people which was called extended services, also known as concierge services. Mm. These were the team of people providing ongoing engagement, value-driven engagement to the customers mm. and lo and behold, we saw the subscription services revenue growing um, right at the same pace, but in some cases even faster than software sales. Yeah. And the value that the customers received, they kept you know, staying with us, they kept growing with us, and lifetime value uh, went up. Probably so that even was, upgrading software packages exactly right, too, right? Exactly right, yeah. so it was all beautiful. But the need for Bolstra came around when uh, after I left Aprimo, and um, became part of a software company based out of Austin, Texas, where I had a responsibility as a chief revenue officer. I had a team responsible for renewals mm. and upsells. Uh, we were traditionalists calling it account managers, but mm. we really were customer success manager. Sure. And what happened is um, the, the metrics that plagues every executive, I was dealing with those metrics which were going in the wrong direction. <laughs> Our churn was high. Yep. Our negative churn, which is upsell, was very, very low. Mm. Our cost of goods sold were extremely high and our gross margins were very low. So when you looked it's at like all of that- It's like the worst case scenario. Exactly, right, exactly right. <laughs> uh, The only one metric that was really, really powerful was our sales metric, acquisition. Mm. So we were build, bringing on 40 to 50 to 60 customers on a quarterly basis, but we were losing companies in the back end, so we had a leaky bucket problem. Yeah. At that point um, was when I realized, reflected back on the days when we were growing customers without even a software technology, it was based on best practices and good team of people. I said, wait a minute, there's gotta be an answer to that. So I called my friends back from the old days of software artistry and a primo. Nice. And I said, we have to build a software platform. Got the band back together. I was the dream that, team. Yeah, yeah seriously. And, and, and they, were, they were so nice that they jumped in with me to help me build what today is a software platform that's geared towards customer success and customer experience, helping companies grow their lifetime value and retain them for life. So I love that story because it touches on so many things. And, and yeah. one of the things that I think is so powerful about what you just shared is the relationships that you maintained along the way. And in, in a lot of ways, it's a little bit of a history lesson of mm -hmm. tech in Indiana. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's interesting even for you know, this has a pretty global audience. You know, uh, we certainly have a lot of listeners in Indianapolis, but our second and third highest list, you know, listener population is in San Francisco and New York um, on the podcast. So for those that don't know the indie tech community, the Indiana or Indianapolis tech community, I think it's interesting to note that most of these sort of like mid-market type of cities like Indianapolis and mm -hmm. Cincinnati, Austin, Nashville, usually can trace back to one or two. I mean, even Silicon Valley, you can trace all the way back to, you know, when silicon chips were being mm -hmm. produced in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. So for those that don't know, do you mind maybe telling the abbreviated version of what software artistry was? Yeah, absolutely. And again, I, I, I smile every time I think about software artistry because that's where uh, you call it a seed that grew into a big tree, which it is now. And Absolutely. there's so many branches of it and so many beautiful Lots companies. Lots of acorns <laughs> fell into this uh, community. <laughs> so software artistry, I joined software artistry right out of college. And uh, <clears throat> a couple of years I did um, at another company that I was a software developer at, which was based out of Terre Haute, Indiana. Came to Indianapolis. What, what was the, what was, uh, the year? What, uh, about about what time, if you, yeah, if you don't know exactly? No, 93. 93, 93 94 okay. time frame. So early on. In early the, on. Yeah. And uh, Software Artistry had a product that sold into customer help desks as a help desk solution. So mm. it was a call center. And we also had change management as well as um, asset management solutions. So it was geared towards IT buyers. Um, that company, I was a, a software engineer, then we became a systems engineering team all the way to when that company got acquired by Tivoli, IBM. Yeah. So I became part of Tivoli Group. Big Blue. Big Blue, it was great. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, my, my, my travels were all over the world, so I, had, I was a global SE for software artistry and then Tivoli. And then I found myself to be in a very large company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I joined Software Artistry, it was amazing. People were, it was a scale-up company yeah. at that point. Yeah. They had just gone public. 
The first company to go public out of Indiana was Software Artistry. Wow, it was a tech so company. It was a tech company, and it That's was an cool. uh, uh, amazing experience. And I didn't know. That, I don't think I knew that. I, yeah. I didn't know that either. Yeah. First tech company that went public in Indiana, Software Artistry. Nice. SWRT was the symbol. I like it. That was wonderful. Well, and, and I mean, that exit has had huge ripple effects. Yeah. Right, going into a, a primo, going, in, I mean, I don't know what company maybe that hasn't affected in Indianapolis, <laughs> but I mean, direct connections. Yeah. Interactive intelligence. Founders of those companies to went on to Interact so, Intelligence, got acquired yeah. by Genesis. Yeah, yeah. 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 Made companies. to manage, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. 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 That's cool. I appreciate you recounting sure. that. And we, we could probably follow that thread for the entirety of this podcast <laughs> and a whole 10, ten, ten, ten <laughs> episode series on that. Um, but I, I think it's interesting to point to that because a lot of times when you enter a, a new market, whether you're graduating from college or you're starting a new office for your company or you're joining a new team and moving to a new city, uh, a lot of times all you see is sort of what's going on in the, the last six months before you got there and what's going on in that immediate moment. And you don't always know that there are deep roots oh, yeah. in, a, in a, any community, any local community, um, usually going back 20, 30 sure, years. Sure. Um, and those things can have huge ripple effects. And the exits that are happening today, um, the, the big acquisitions that are happening, I know Rook Security re recently okay. got acquired here in town. Yep. Uh, there are several others that are that have happened and are happening. Um, no spoiler alerts on this podcast, though. <laughs> Stay tuned. Um, those are going to have huge ripple effects going forward as well. And so it's it's just cool to kind of point that out uh, to listeners because it's fun. It's fun in, in my role to be able to see a lot of that in Indy, but also in a lot of the other markets like Raleigh Durham and. Denver and I mean the SendGrid acquisition now is yes. is big in Denver. Yes. Uh, tons of things happening, mm -hmm. um, so it's just kind of kind of cool to see. And Yao, I know you were uh, you're in the banking world there for a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, you could you mind talking a little bit about your work that you did with yeah. City Securities and, and maybe what you learned from from that? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, yeah. So I worked for City Securities, a boutique investment bank here in Indianapolis. And uh, so I was on their corporate finance group where we did a lot of merger and acquisition advisory work for, for companies here in town. And uh, so I, I joined the company at a pretty interesting time, 2007. So like the, the market is just exploding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's like multiple d dynamics where, uh, you know, everybody's looking for capital, yeah. uh, but capital is dry. Um, but then it's also an opportune time to, if you are capital rich, to make acquisitions and find those strategic partners to go out and uh, work with. When you said exploding, did you mean exploding in a good way? In or a bad, bad way. way? Okay. <laughs> a well, bad it's, way. it's sort of like yeah. it was good for city yeah, securities, yeah, yeah. but it was bad for everyone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a great point. Uh, um, and so, yeah, that that time was was pretty formative for me. Like the first year for me was just drinking from a fire hose. I, Coming from engineering out of school and then going into finance was kind of a new world. Yeah. Um, so like I could probably write a book around all the <laughs> yeah, things totally. I, I learned. But um, one of the things that I found pretty fascinating was uh, just how how crucial understanding uh, like more macroeconomic factors factor into businesses on a micro scale. Oh yeah. So uh, you you look at uh, well I probably won't name specific companies but there there's companies here in town when. Markets crash, they serve consumers, consumer spending dries up, their business has to adjust very quickly. Yeah. And so we, we, you know, in the business, we were tasked with trying to figure out, well, what are the other markets that you can use to grow and find pockets of, you know, um, pockets of revenue that you can continue the, operating the business until that, mm -hmm. <laughs> until yeah. you that storm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was a good time. And, um. Um, yeah, fascinating time to kind of be there. Well, and that kind of plays plays into both of you starting businesses in the customer experience space. You know, it's an interesting time where it's sort of like there has been a boom in people adopting <laughs> software mm -hmm. and new technologies, and people understand that like it's just as important, if not more important, mm -hmm. to grow your existing customers than acquire new customers. If you've got a leaky bucket, sure. you're putting money in to yeah. acquire customers. If the, if the lifetime value isn't there, and even if it is there, but could be 2x or yep. 3x what it is, yeah. um, sometimes even more than that, depending on what industry you're in, 
uh, that that's a huge opportunity. So so being in a market, I guess is what I'm saying, that is ex yeah. is exploding in a good way. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Expanding is probably a better verb. But here at Powder Keg, we love the word exploding. So um, expanding in a good way um, is, is pretty interesting that you both ended up in that space. Um, yeah. The examples, and, the example that you just gave, and, and we were talking a little bit about stats before. Yeah. Um, it is amazing how uh, if, if there's anybody listening to this podcast and is not thinking about having a uh, create an experience, a pleasurable experience with, with value-based outcomes for their customers, uh, they gotta you know, smell the roses because <laughs> things are not good for them. Yeah. Because right now, as, as the stats goes, that 90% of the lifetime revenue from a customer comes post initial sale. Yeah. So what you get in the beginning is only 10% of mm. the total revenue that comes mm. throughout the life of the customer. And it takes approximately, there's a rule of thumb that people have you know, thrown some numbers at 13 cents into retention versus $1.25 to acquire a customer. Mm. So it's like, duh, <laughs> why wouldn't you focus your efforts into ex pleasurable experiences, but with outcomes because the experience by itself is not the full story. You yeah. got to deliver desired outcomes with good experiences and that's what you should be doing right now and, mm -hmm. I, and i'm glad to hear how things are happening and how this space is growing yeah every day. what can, can you give us maybe the the elevator pitch on bolstra what does bolstra do yeah so bolstra is a software platform and we have designed this platform for customer success managers or people who are responsible for creating those outcomes for their customers after they sign on so think about the steps that a customer goes through once you sign them on. Whether it's and this is probably more of like a B2B. B2B, it's yeah. a B2B. And so onboarding, training, uh, business reviews, uh, retrospectives, expansions, renewals, all of the stages of the customer journey that exist post initial sale, we manage it through our software mm -hmm. and with automating playbooks that prescribe what needs to be done mm -hmm. for customer success managers. I love that, mm -hmm. I love that. Uh, and yeah, you're on more of the B2C side. Yeah. When you when you talk to customers today, I mean, you, we heard your initial go to market yeah. of you're taking in uh, <laughs> you're taking in orders <laughs> and literally going into what did that turn into in terms of the platform? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the platform now it's a we're kind of like a data layer that moves data between uh, siloed products. So we our initial uh, platform connects into Shopify. So mm -hmm. we grab order data from Shopify. We take that and we will uh, send <clears throat> a tracking number to a carrier like FedEx or UPS. They give us a real-time stream of events happening with that particular package. And then we connect into uh, a company's e-commerce platform. So you use that event data, then trigger emails to your customers. Let them know where their package is in transit. Um, and so, and then once, once they get that email, they click through and they get to a tracking page. And that's, we, we've been telling brands, that's a landed tracking page for you to build your brand. Yeah. Uh, what is the experience that you want to deliver to that customer at a moment when their emotions are very high, right? Mm -hmm. They're anxious to know where their packages are excited. You should be using that to communicate things that make them become a lifetime customer. Uh, and so everything that we're doing is around customer experience. The interesting thing is we have, we, we, serve, we serve two masters. So like you said, Harish, we sell the B2B but the end product that we have to build is B2C. Mm -hmm. And so we have to understand the dynamics around how do we make our customers successful by making their customers experience really great. Mm. Um, and, and where do we invest our resources and energy along that spectrum to know, you know what, what's going to give us the most impact today um, in, the, in the future with the business? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, so could you mind sharing maybe a story or two of some of the unique ways that yeah. customers have yeah. surprised and delighted their customers yeah. at that moment of like, hey, where's my package? I yeah. haven't, haven't heard anything hit my doorstep. <laughs> so there's a couple of ways. So one is uh, we, we, can, we can detect when uh, a package is, is going to arrive early or late. Uh, so I think my dog can do that too. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, he loses Something his mind air. every yeah. time. Every time a package hits our doorstep, and sometimes I swear it's like thirty seconds before the truck even yeah. pulls up. I'm just like, how did you know that? That's awesome. But he has enormous ears, so I, I think he's cheating. That's so sorry. Yeah. No, knowing I, I really took that I need, on a tangent. I need your dog on my engineering team. Yeah, <laughs> happy to help. He is pulling in no revenue right now for the for the family unit. Oh, so. That's awesome. <laughs> 
<laughs> so so I'll, I'll give two quick stories. So like um, when 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 something arrives uh, late, for instance, like it's all about. You probably know uh, would would like uh, have a lot more insight into this. And like so much of managing successful outcomes is expectation setting. Mm -hmm. So it's like if we set the expectation that the package is going to arrive on this date and it changes. Um, there's some anger there, right? If we didn't tell you at all and it just showed up, there might be less anger, um, but they'd still probably be frustrated because they're gonna wonder when the thing is going to arrive, right? Uh, so if we set the expectation and we do not deliver on that expectation and we don't tell our customers, they're gonna be very frustrated. So having those like dynamics and if we know something's gonna arrive early, let's let our customers know because they're probably sitting, probably sitting in an apartment complex somewhere, probably gets stolen off their porch. So that anxiety is there. Um, so one of our, one of our, not related to that, but a different, different customer story. Um, we're working with a cookware brand, and they were getting a lot of product reviews that, um, you know, people would. I didn't realize this. I, I don't. I cook, but like I'm not. <laughs> I'm not a professional. Not cook to that by level. Any means, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know how to make a mean macaroni. Uh, so uh, apparently, when you put a pot on the stove, you're not supposed to crank it on high. You're supposed to warm it on medium for two minutes, and when you crank it on high. Uh, to warm it up, you'll burn the pan and it will it'll be, become ruined. So they were getting a lot of bad product reviews that were like, hey, you said this is professional chef quality pots, but they're, they're getting ruined really quickly. And so they're like, how do we figure out how to solve this problem? So we use the tracking page to deliver care tips. So there's four tips around how to, how to season your pots and pans, how to make different types of food um, with different techniques, how to care for your cookware. Uh, so that tracking page gets, uh, incredible click-through rate so you think of like a Facebook ad gets you know a, a two to three percent click-through rate uh, they're seeing 16 20 percent mm -hmm. click-throughs on those care related items wow. um, and when the customer does that when they go and look at those uh, those pages they feel great about the brand they get excited to, to use the cookware and then they go through and make additional purchases so That's it's great. Like closing that loop around that experience is, is, is really beneficial for the brand because they're delivering on education that helps their customers be successful and it helps the brand get longevity with that customer and possibly more revenue in those instances. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I, I need to buy some new cookware. So <laughs> yeah. might, might need to get the name of that brand after <laughs> I, the I, show. I, I got you. Awesome. Man. I, I think I, that's what happened in my last set was I just, you know, Saturday morning, time to make brunch. Yeah. Set it on high. Yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. want to wait for this thing I, exactly. to heat up. I need to get hot right now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, and Haresh, I know you're in some ways doing a lot of the similar things, but but more on the B2B mm -hmm. front and, and helping uh, people better utilize the software yep. that they buy and B2B products that they buy. Uh, do you mind maybe sharing a, one of your favorite examples? Sure, absolutely. I'll share two examples if that's okay. I've got several customers, uh, but let me share. I learned them. something from every single example. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Like, like that example I'm, that you just shared, yeah, yeah, I'm already thinking, all right, how can we better help when when people sign up to be part of the yeah. powder cake ta okay. talent and careers network mm -hmm. where they're looking for the best companies to work for you know how do we immediately start kind of coaching them and giving them yeah. tips along the way so yeah. every time i hear one of these i'm trying to translate all right <laughs> how do i how do i apply this cookware example to <laughs> powder cake yeah i love it so the couple of companies that i will talk about where we have engaged with them and they are our customers and how they are leveraging customer success platform uh, to deliver value to their customers one of them is uh, a chicago based company they are global and um, i remember that when we sat down with their uh, steering committee that was uh, evaluating a solution a software because uh, the business of customer success, customer experience in a B2B environment is pretty high touch. It's human to human mm -hmm. interactions. You know it's a big business when there's a steering committee to make decisions uh, yeah, on absolutely. purchases too. And, and uh, trust me, I was in a bake-off to, <laughs> to win that uh, That's opportunity. That's awesome. So it was, it Hopefully was your pans experience. weren't burnt. No, no, it, yeah. was, it was great. Yeah, you're talking about uh, cookware. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> so we were sitting down and we said, okay, first of all, what is, I mean, you guys are growing. Um, you don't have a churn problem so they said we don't have a churn problem our customers are there so I said okay if you don't have a churn metric problem what is the problem right I mean what are you looking at solution for number one they said well we don't have a churn problem but we have a negative churn problem we want to grow our customers expand our customers and keep renewing their customer our customers with more opportunities to sell 
All right. And, and it just wasn't happening. No, it wasn't happening. happening. It wasn't happening. Gotcha. And, uh, and the reason why people weren't leaving is because they had a really good software, but they weren't necessarily growing their customers. Mm. Number two, when we found out, okay, what else is it that you're looking for a customer success, customer experience solution? And they said, our customer success managers, who are the lifeblood of our company where it comes to delivering value to our customers and value for our customers, they're living a life of a nightmare, which is friction that goes into going in six different solutions to find the details about a customer. And so there's about six hours of prep time that goes into a one hour meeting. Mm -hmm. And right there, we need a solution that brings the customer 360 view in one place for the CSM so they can be effective and efficient in delivering that. So what would be like a, an, an example of that? If you're, if you're, if you're, uh, this big global B2B sure. company, sure. what systems would you be going into yeah, so, to, to gather what kind of data? Yeah, so the very first thing we did is we did an architecture diagram to see which systems are people going to. Salesforce was one of the systems. Sure. Um, they were using NetSuite, mm -hmm. which is an ERP system to get data about the customer there. There was another contract management system where they were looking at contracts about the customer that they wanted to have access to. Mm -hmm. They were then going into Google Sheets and Smart Sheets and Post-it Notes and Binders mm -hmm and their tribal knowledge to figure out what they did with the customer last time they spoke to. So because the systems were so many and they were silos, there were too many fiefdoms. And so the delivery of customer value was slow and not on time and customer success managers ended up being reactive rather than proactive mm -hmm. in their approach. And that was the biggest need for them to look for a customer success solution. Why, why do customer success um leaders or practitioners need to be proactive rather than reactive? Yeah, very I know good. that sounds like a dumb question, but that's what I'm here for. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 <laughs> <laughs> very good. So I will tell you that uh, I get engaged in a lot of companies that have support services tools. Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there are many out there that you call 1-800-SUPPORT-DESK. In a B2B world, support is traditionally looked at as firefighting because it's got, you got a problem, your screen's frozen, you got a call to make sure your system is back up again. And that's reactive support because yep. you're waiting for people to call you. Customer success is proactive. And the reason why you need to be proactive is because you wanna make sure that you lead the customer towards the destination, which is growth and retention. Mm. So you gotta keep making sure that you don't get a call from a customer that says, hey, listen, I bought your software and yes, we high-fived when we saw the demo, but the value has not yet been received by us. So the reason why customer success management team exists is not necessarily for break fix, it's for delivering ongoing, continuous value from the time you embark the journey with your customer. So in a lot of ways, it's, it's similar to, hey, before you burn the pan, yeah. why don't we be proactive and yeah. tell you how to use the pan yeah. rather than waiting till you get the negative Amazon review. It's yeah, just yeah, yeah. the same B2C yeah. problem yeah. in B2B exactly. world in a lot of ways. I'd be, I'd be curious to hear too, like I, I imagine every, every business's growth drivers are a little bit different. So do you, do you measure, like can a brand pull in like very disparate data sources to measure those like, Hey, we, we actually discovered this is a big this is a big data point that says this customer is going to churn. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, once again, to have a good visibility about the customer is also to manage the customer's health. Mm. And health is not necessarily the temperature; it's the signals uh. that the customer is exuding from different systems that they are using. Mm. NPS systems are one of those, mm -hmm. right? Survey data, net promoter is, score, net promoter score. Yep. That's where you get the signal from. The other ones are support desk. Say, for example, you are calling your customer support line 10 times mm -hmm. in the same day and all of them are said one call, severity one, that's a signal. Then again, I'm sending you marketing communication and you are not even opening my emails or not even clicking into the links, but you're deleting them and I've got a cookie that's tracked. That's a signal. So those are some of the areas that you measure information from and those are called quantitative measures. Mm -hmm. But then what our CSMs do with our software is also measure the engagement <clears throat> that they are creating with their customer. Meaning, if I schedule the meeting with my customer as a CSM for a QBR, quarterly business review, mm -hmm. and you decline that meeting, or the meeting stayed there for a long time but you never joined, 
and I did not close that activity that I had created, it's still sitting in my to-do lane or in my on-hold lane, well, that's a qualitative measure of there's something, there's a problem. Mm. So what we do is we marry the qualitative and the quantitative signals together to provide the measures that will be effective. Yeah, that's phenomenal. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, do you, you, going back to net promoter score, um, for those that maybe don't know net promoter score, and, and I've also seen some people uh, maybe not using net promoter score uh, the way it was initially intended to, to be used. Mm -hmm. And I, actually, I think we did that you know several years ago when we first started using it. Um, how have you seen net promoter score be used most effectively, either, whether it's in your own business or in other businesses that you've worked with? Yeah. <clears throat> and maybe even start by just the, the quick flyover. Sure. How would you define net promoter score? So the way we did net promoter scores is um, we did it twice a year. We can do it every quarter uh, net promoter score. But it's asking the questions, how's our engagement been with you? And would you recommend us to your peers? Sure. And then we have a scale of one to 10. Uh, if you're within the, the, the lower uh, uh, quartile, if you would, then you are a detractor. If you are in the upper, then you are a promoter. Otherwise, you are, you know, steady, steady flow. And so a detractor is going to actively root against you. basically won't, root won't, against exactly you, spread right. bad. Yeah, they won't be your advocates if you're looking yeah. for them. To they'll be the they'll actually be the, the opposite. That's exactly right. Uh, whereas a promoter, they're going to go out of their way That's exactly to right. say, you know what, you need yeah. to. You talk to this company yeah. because we are very happy with that company. Yep. Um, now, there is a gotcha in net promoter scores or SAT metrics, which is also another form of uh, surveying. Mm -hmm. They are lagging indicators. Yeah. Right? So if I did a net promoter score last quarter, and if I'm doing it quarterly, let's say, for example, my last uh, uh, quarter's net promoter score that I'm looking at the, through that lens is through a lagging indicator. Yeah. What you need to do is pay attention to those because those are important. But I think what's really important is when you deliver the value, achieve a milestone, do a customer sentiment survey right at that point. So you are now tracking the information real time and you're also measuring that against with other variables or mm. other measures to give a true score. Oh, I like that piece yeah. of advice. Anything you would add to that, yeah? <laughs> I don't think I could add anything better than that. That was that was great. Harish is the wizard of, <laughs> yeah. of cu customer sat. I don't know about that. I'm learning. <laughs> yeah, we um. need to get you a wizard cloak or something. That would be pretty awesome. Uh, well, um, as, as you guys have both grown your business, how have you been paying attention to your own customer success and customer experience? Uh, at Malomo, I mean, in the yeah. startup world, that can be a really trying time like in the, those early days when you're literally working with customers taking in data manually creating emails manually yeah. you know there, there can be some lag in value delivery and so i've heard i've heard you mention you know setting expectations mm -hmm. uh being an important thing in e-commerce i'm guessing that probably translates yeah. to, to your business as well so our 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 uh, our lead designer uh she she comes into the office every day and says we need a CSM. <laughs> she's, so she, she's like, because right now it's like it's it's kind of falling on her because she like most of the services work that we do is like designing out the emails and the tracking pages on behalf of our clients. Sure, sure. And so she takes the brunt of like some of the the feedback directly from clients. Um, so no, as an early stage company, we we live or die by our, our early cohort of customers being incredibly happy. Mm -hmm. Like they have to, like you said, Harish, they have to be promoters. Uh, even if they're in that like that middle ground, yeah. they, they could, that could be dangerous for us as a business because yep. we've got to go to our investors um, and any prospective investors and, and tell them we've we've found a group of companies, we've built a product, they've gotten ROI and they're super happy, and we know there's a market that's there's incredibly more that we could find that look like this. Um, so we a lot of time uh, we spend a lot of time investing in just personal like. Uh, I, I think somebody told me Bill Godfrey said this like he loves assurance services yeah. like you, yeah. you if every month you're providing a a like tangible service for your customers that could be like a unique report that could be insights that you can use uh, if, if you could do that every month along with the platform that you provide on a monthly basis um, you kind of I wouldn't say you put that on autopilot, but as an early stage company, you can get some assurance that they're going to renew every month. 
Yeah. Um, and so that's how we've been thinking about it early stage because we're like you, Matt. Like you, you probably have a very limited team. So you've you've got probably engineers who are trying to build the product, designers designing the product, salespeople selling the product. But who's making sure the customers are great? Like that probably falls everybody. on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you and everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but who like who's the one that's talking to those customers? Yeah. Who like, owns right? it? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and usually it's like, well, nobody, nobody's like defined as a person they should go to, um, to have those like qualitative conversations. So we've, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a mixed bag right now, but we're very, we're trying to be very intentional given the, the company and, and product we're trying to build. Yeah. It changed the game when, uh, Meg, who was running content for us, we're like, well, half of what we do is making sure our customers are displayed right in our content and are getting yeah. visibility. Um, we're just like. You're now the CSM, <laughs> yeah. and that cha that changed everything because she's like, okay, I own it, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and I, and now I own the NPS score, which yes. means I own this and yeah. this, and yeah. now she's building the systems to make sure it happens. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean she's doing all of it, but everyone knows, you know, she and who's running events, and Robert on the product, and you know, like all of those things kind of came together once we defined it. Correct as a function yeah but it took us a while to get there you know there's that awkward stage where <laughs> where you got to figure out all right how does this how does this get done yeah yeah, yeah that's great i love that 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 concept of assurance yeah. services yeah anything you'd add to that uh, other than the fact that everybody in our so we drink our own i i like to call it bourbon rather than champagne. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we use our own product and one of the things that we have done is first of all to have uh, to deliver value, it requires human the communication, right? There's engagement that mm. people are actually in the seat that are, they empathize with the situation, they are technically savvy, they understand the needs of the customer, and they have a mind who, which is like, okay, if I do this, I'm going to get a reciprocity from a customer, which is in the term of growth. Mm. So if you think about the role of a customer success manager, I've been calling it a unicorn. They are a unicorn. They yeah. have got several hats that they wear mm -hmm. and bless their heart for the job that they do now. So first of all, hire the right talent uh, for the role. And then don't put all of the burden on a CSM because customer success or customer experience should not be considered as a departmental issue. It's an enterprise-wide philosophy. Mm -hmm. So in our organization, our marketing team has access to our software. Our R&D team has access to our software, and of course our customer success managers, even I have access to our software. So if any measure dips or goes sideways or goes up, or any journey is delayed in their ability, in our ability to deliver that, everybody on the team knows about it and they jump in based on our automated playbooks. So yeah. final point is the customer success should not be just viewed as a departmental thing, it should be viewed as an enterprise by philosophy. Mm, I like that. That's good. I, I'm, I'm taking away a lot from this conversation. This is great. Make sure the whole team listens to this. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I, uh, I, I, I could keep asking you questions about customer success, but I'm going to pivot just a little bit because you both have uh, your business based here in, in mm -hmm. central Indiana. You've both uh, been involved with several companies here in central Indiana. What is it about this particular market that made you decide, yeah, when I start this business, I want it to be here and, and not in New York or in San Francisco or Toronto for that matter. Let you go first. <laughs> I, I, I'll be happy to go. Um, for me to make a decision why be in Indianapolis and start a company in Indiana in Indianapolis is just one main reason and that is I've gotten a lot from Indiana. Mm -hmm. uh, I am where I am based on the connections and based on the network that has helped me and um, my kids were born in the state of Indiana um, and uh, they went to school here. I love the community. I love the people. I've got great friends. Uh, even in my competitive base, when I was in the marketing automation space and there was a lot of marketing automation companies that we were competing with, but they are awesome people. So given the dynamics of what it gave to me, I, there was no other place for me to be at but here. That's a great answer. I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd love to echo that. That's so true. <laughs> Indiana has given me a lot. Um, uh, I, yeah, I was when I graduated, I was ready to go to the coast. I thought that's where that's where product yep. development, new technology, innovation happened, and uh, and the OR fellowship kind of sucked me in, and and it kept me here. And it and then you very quickly build a network. One of the things I love about Indy is everybody is so accessible. Yeah. So like you can you can have 
you know, a coffee with somebody who yeah. scaled exact target, yeah, uh, exactly. scaled a pre-mail, scaled exactly. interactive intelligence, scaled Angie's list. Uh, and then you can, you can also meet with people on the front lines uh, who have to wade through the trenches in a lot of different problems. Um, and so like the accessibility and, and being able to just tap somebody when you're going through a particular problem. Matt, I called you like three or four times when I was raising my round. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and like being able to talk to other CEOs who are at your stage or a little bit uh, ahead of you. Um, it, sh it just feels like, I mean, I haven't been in a lot of communities, but this doesn't feel normal or natural to me <laughs> <laughs> to have that level of, level of access to some of these people. So. Um, yeah, Indian is great, and like uh, there's a there's a strong concentration and talent pool here, uh, and then there's like a secret weapon that I feel like uh, I'm obviously biased, but the Ore Fellowship I think is I don't know how you replicate that. That's amazing. Yeah, it's so amazing. unique. It's so unique. Um, I think the closest thing I've seen is Venture for America. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, there there is a national program called Venture for America, but it, it's not quite the same. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I I don't I don't think anything that's scaled nationally like that will have the same yep. level yeah. of connectivity and uniqueness yeah. uh, and value add that something built for a specific community would have. That's very true. But I, I agree that that was uh, very unique and I was only giving, sharing my experiences cause I had been through it and I would have been on the phone with someone, you <laughs> yeah. know, six months before having the exact same conversation. <laughs> I'm so I'm like, yeah. I gotta, I gotta, Share this knowledge, yeah. yeah, and pay it forward. Yeah, exactly. It's That's like, I don't true. want other people to have the same struggles that I had. So it's, so it's um, yeah, it, it has been an awesome community. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you both for sharing your knowledge around customer experience, the entrepreneurial journey, and uh, coming back on the show uh, for a little bit more in-depth conversation on this. Very much excited for your pitches on August 13th here in Indianapolis, yes. downtown, yeah. all focused on customer experience. We've got both of your companies as well as Genesis yeah. presenting. We've got uh, some VCs who are or uh, sorry, investment bankers who are gonna be advisors. We're going to have some folks who are community leaders, some folks who are co-founders of companies giving feedback, and then we'll even have a number of companies exhibiting uh, there as well. So if you wanna check that out, friends of Powder Keg, go to powderkeg.com slash events, or if you are not able to make it in town and you're in Australia tuning in, you can go to facebook.com slash Powder Keg. But thank you both again for being on the show. I, yeah, thank you very much. And yeah. I'm sure uh, Yao will echo that what Matt, you have done and the team at Powder Keg has done to help us not only build a foundation here, but grow. And what you've done for the community is amazing. And thank you. Thanks yeah. for the opportunity. You're a phenomenal advocate. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you both for the opportunity to do it. Yeah. If I didn't get to do this kind of work, I don't know what I would do. It's fun. A lot of fun. <laughs> well, I really appreciate it. And um, I just want to say thank you again for tuning in, Powder Keggers. I hope you walk away feeling inspired and armed with lots of insights. Make sure you follow both of our guests on social media. We will have that linked up in the show notes at powderkeg.com. Just go to the most recent articles, look up this uh, episode number, episode 96, and you will find those. And to be among the first to hear the stories about entrepreneurs, investors, and other tech leaders outside of Silicon Valley, subscribe to us on iTunes at powderkeg.com slash iTunes. Leave a review while you're there. If you don't mind, reviews help us reach more people. Uh, and at the same time, it's just great to hear from you. So we might even uh, call out some of those on a future episode. And until then, we'll catch you next time on Powder Keg Igniting Startups. Mm -hmm.